So one of the girls was saying how she had found her father on MySpace. Mm -hmm. um, so I shared my story and I'm like, you know what? Everybody, literally everybody and their mom was on social media. Yeah. So let me try. Yeah. So I went, my first thing was MySpace. Um, search around on MySpace. Didn't really find much on MySpace. And I'm like, you know what? Let me check Facebook. Yeah. So I did the whole alumni thing and I was going through it um, at the time with my then boyfriend. And he's like, yo, that's your mom. And he's like, wait a minute, I know her. <gasps> no. Yes. And I'm like, nah, you're lying. He was like, yeah, no, we went to the same church together. She wow. was the reason that he had gotten saved and everything. <gasps> so yeah, oh, it, it, it gets crazier, even crazier than that. What is yeah. that he's, he's one of my really good friends, so I love Jordan. So he was super kind and he was like, Linda, let's let's turn the tables and let's, you know, let's get to know you and your story because he was just super excited that I was talking to a bunch of like CI people, but like I started Art and Hustle because I had, was doing like art shows and I was like trying to get in the space of like more, um, more doing my art and like pushing my passions, pushing my love. And um, when once COVID hit, I was like, well, I, I really want to talk to all of these people that I've met because I feel like there's all these giants among us you know and mm -hmm. i feel like everybody has a story and i feel like every story will help and every story will heal because no matter what you're going through there's somebody else that could possibly hear your story and it helped them to feel like they're not alone you know so yep. that's why i appreciate you coming on and telling your story because you know you probably had you know all kinds of things that's happened to you and you can give out you know your experiences and your stories to help somebody else yeah, and that's what I tell people a lot of times, you know, like sometimes people are like, oh, you share too much on your Facebook. And it's like, yeah, but you never know who's going through the same thing you're going through. You never know. You know, a lot of times people do feel alone, especially um, with dealing with domestic abuse. Yeah. You know, a lot of times you feel ice you are isolated in those situations. conversation welcome crystal i'm so excited to have you here i had um in the process of editing your mom's uh charmonique's podcast and i was like oh my god i had you on facebook and messenger and we were gonna link up so i'm so glad we're finally getting to link up today so welcome to. to the podcast so thank you for having me you're welcome introduce yourself a little bit i i saw your bio but i would love to uh get you to uh, tell the people about you. Okay, so I am Crystal Morrell. Um, I'm 35 years old. I'm a single mom. Um, I have multiple products under my LLC for my business. Um, I like fancy stuff. I like lights. <laughs> I love to decorate. Yeah, um, me that's too. Kind of like me with, too. with my business, I just make everything look pretty. Yeah, that's amazing because like I am the same way. Like I love to craft. I love to decorate. I love like little lights and twinklies. But yeah, definitely like I love to make things pretty. <laughs> That's one of the things I love oh, to do. So let's read your bio a little bit. So you are the CEO of Checkmate Suites, um, domestic violence survivor, domestic violence advocate, as well as a public speaker, born and raised in Central Islip. Um, you started baking at five years old, which is amazing. Yeah, um, before I can reach the oven. That's amazing. And then you in some eating. places, I still can't reach the oven because I'm little. <laughs> <laughs> um, you started your business back in a DV shelter back in 2017. In a game of chess, you're supposed to anticipate your opponent's next move, and he didn't anticipate mine. So checkmate. I love it. Thank you. Um, he didn't anticipate, and he was also herb you're also a herbalist, um, having lupus and nerve damage. Um, you learned to treat yourself naturally with herbs and plants. And you also cater to all kinds of products with or without cannabis, gluten, nuts, non-dairy, and vegan. And that's amazing because your mom loves to bake and she's super crafty and all of that. Yes. It, it's so funny how like we're literally before and after kids. Like yeah. <laughs> we're practically the same person. I know. And I, when I, she sent me the photo, she's like, I was like, can I see a photo? And you guys are like twins. 
Yes. And if you see my little, my baby brother, we're like triplets if you put all three of us together, except he's six two. Oh my God, that is crazy. So I, she told me her story and I would love to hear your story, your side of um, all of it. Um, so I found her on Facebook. I didn't know any of her information was sort of like, I didn't even know her name. Only thing I knew is that um, she went to see a high school mm -hmm. and I knew the year she graduated. So mm -hmm. when I found her at that point on Facebook, um, you know, you could search through alumni. Oh. Um, all you had to do was click on the year and yeah. everyone who put in, okay, they graduated the year would, would come up. Yeah. I don't know if that option is, they still do that anymore, mm -hmm. but then it was. So I just went and was flipping through a lot of different pictures and stuff like that. And I came across hers and I'm like, she got my face. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, like you can't miss it. You're like, okay, if you were looking for your mother, that would be it. Cause she's your twin. Yeah. You know, we just separated by 13 years. You know, she was born first. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Oh my God. So what age were you when you finally decided you wanted to look for your mother? Um, I want to say I was like 16 because I was in high school. Mm -hmm. And at that time I was doing, I was, um, so I was in high school musical. I was Annie and you know, Annie was looking for her parents. So I'm yeah. like, you know yeah. what? Let me let me try see what I could do because I know at once I um, was the age of 16, I can request my records from the state agency. Yeah. So I sent out for information, didn't get anything back. So I let it go. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it just wasn't the time. And then um, I think it was like 22, 23 years. I was working at Chili's and me and my coworkers on Mondays when we would get off from the, um, the lunch shift, we would have margarita Mondays. So, you know, yeah. we'd Everyone pick a pick a flavor and we'll share and we'll talk and stuff like that. So one of the girls was saying how she had found her father on MySpace. Mm -hmm. um, so I shared my story and I'm like, you know what? Everybody, literally everybody and their mama's on social media. Yeah. So let me try. Yeah. So I went, my first thing was MySpace. Um, search around on MySpace. Didn't really find much on MySpace. And I'm like, you know what? Let me check Facebook. Yeah. So I did the whole alumni thing and I was going through it um, at the time with my then boyfriend. And he's like, yo, that's your mom. And he's like, wait a minute. I know her. <gasps> no. Yes. And I'm like, nah, you're lying. He was like, yeah, no, we went to the same church together. She wow. was the reason that he had gotten saved and everything. <gasps> So yeah, oh, it, it it gets crazier, even crazier than that. So yeah. I had a friend in elementary school. I went to Mulligan. Yeah. Um, her name was Tasha. Mm -hmm. Me and Tasha were like best friends. Yeah. We will always lie. I'm like, yeah, we cousins, we cousins, we cousins. Yeah. Come to find out we're actually first cousins. Really? Like, our mom, oh, yeah, my, our moms are sisters. Oh my God, that's crazy. Like there's so many different ways that we could have met. Um, even as uh, a kid, my adoptive mom told me that at one point I was must have been like four years old. I was in a stroller. And you know how they have the um, Memorial Day parade every year? Yeah. So, you know, my mom, she was a uh, rhythm marcher, whatever they called them back then, color guard, whatever. Yeah. I did the same thing in high school too. Yeah. Um, so she was like, at one point I was in a stroller and we literally rolled right past her. No. Mm -hmm. really? and she was friends with my neighbors like it's crazy because like I know her friends wow like yeah it's such a small world but you know everything happens for a reason it was a reason why we met at the time that we met versus yeah. earlier so yeah oh my god yeah like it's crazy how she was explaining it too and just to see her side and then I'm like oh my god I need to talk talk to Crystal and like get her side of it too because all the little like synchronicities and little events that lined up and you could have met, like, it's just crazy. Yep. Like I had asked her, um, like one of my neighbors was Dion and Didi and Dion had passed away. And I asked her cause I knew she was um, at that time then, I, knew, I didn't know then that she was friends with Didi or anything. So I asked, you know, did you go to Dion's funeral? And she was like, yeah, I went to Dion's funeral. And I asked, you know, did you ever get up to go towards the front to see the body or anything? And she's like, no. And I'm like, had you had she would have walked up, she would have saw me. <gasps> wow. There's Dion and Didi were my babysitters. Didi was my hairdresser. Uh -huh. So, you know, she would do my hair. I would talk to her all the time. I was always hung out at their house. Wow. That's just... yeah, same as when they had their graduation party. I'd ask her, like, hey, did you go to the graduation party? 
And she was like, no, I didn't go to the graduation party because there was a fight that broke out. Yeah. And um, my parents were letting people in the house. Yeah. People who were like running away and stuff like that were letting people in the house. And I'm like, well, you could have seen me then too. Oh <laughs> like there's so many different instances where we could have met each other. Yeah, yeah. Like she, I think she said like, you know, she could have been walking past the store and then, you know, at one point she thinks that she had saw you like maybe walk past her or something like that, you know? I'm pretty sure we did. I'm pretty sure we ha we crossed paths plenty of times but didn't realize it. Wow. Because, you know, see, I, it's, it's, it ain't that like our town is that big. Yeah, so. yeah. And then she told me that, um, so when I, I had one of these podcasts where my friend uh, flipped the tables on me and then he interviewed me for, you know, the Art and Hustle podcast. You're in CI, Jordan Turk. Yeah. <laughs> and you had I him. I Mr. Turk. He was my social studies teacher. I, it was either ninth or tenth grade. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was ninth grade, but yeah, he was he was my social studies teacher then. I just had to crush on him. <laughs> I got all A's in that class because I was paying attention. I sat in the front row, like, oh my god, that's amazing. That's so funny. Yeah, Jordan. Yeah. He's he's one of my really good friends, so I love Jordan. So he was super kind, and he was like, Linda, let's let's turn the tables and let's you know let's get to know you and your story because. He was just super excited that I was talking to a bunch of like CI people, but like I started Art and Hustle because I had was doing like art shows and I was like trying to get in the space of like more um, more doing my art and like pushing my passions, pushing my love. And um, when once COVID hit, I was like, well, I, I really want to talk to all of these people that I've met because I feel like there's all these giants among us, you know, and mm -hmm. I feel like everybody has a story and I feel like every story will help and every story will heal because no matter what you're going through, there's somebody else that could possibly hear your story and it helped them to feel like they're not alone, you know? So yes. that's why I appreciate you coming on and telling your story because, you know, you've probably had, you know, all kinds of things that's happened to you and you can give out, you know, your experiences and your stories to help somebody else. Yeah, and that's what I tell people a lot of times, you know, like sometimes people are like, oh, you share too much on your Facebook. And it's like, yeah, but you never know who's going through the same thing you're going through. You never know. You know, a lot of times people do feel alone, especially um, with dealing with domestic abuse. Yeah. You know, a lot of times you feel ice, you are isolated in those situations. So, you know, just knowing that someone else out there is going through the same thing as you, has been through the same thing as you, can give you advice on how to get out, how to, how to work, work your way around it and things like that. It's always good to know that you're not alone. Yeah, I exactly. So tell us a little about like how old were you and how long were you in this relationship um that ended up in domestic violence? Um so we were together for about 3 years. We met in 2013, 2014 around that time um working for the Spirit of New York. Um I had just gotten back from working in Hawaii uh for the Norwegian Cruise Line. Mm -hmm. So I kind of got stuck with working on cruise boats. So it was like, okay, this is something I like to do. I like working yeah. on the water. So but and then you can travel the world. Well, I mean, it wasn't much traveling. So with Norwegian, we were um, in a, we just went around the islands of Hawaii. So okay. every day you were on an island. There was okay. no such thing as sea days or anything. I loved it. Yeah, the atmosphere. I didn't like working, but so much. But um, whew, that's a whole other story. <laughs> um, but yeah, it it was nice. I mean, just being able to say, not just like, okay, I went to Hawaii. Okay, I work in Hawaii. I go to, I've been to the islands of Hawaii. I can tell yeah. you places to go, it's things to go it's see. There. Oh my gosh, it is like my my ten year, well maybe fifteen year goal is to move to Hawaii. Like mm. I love it. I like the heat. I I like the culture. Everything is laid back. Like yeah. not people is not like so uptight. Like living in New York City. So mm -hmm. it's I love it yeah I want to go back but yeah so being in uh the relationship with he's also my daughter's father okay. I don't like using that I normally say sperm donor but I'm gonna be nice that's that's all of the contribution that we did thank you yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah I mean um so with that like well a lot of people don't seem to understand it, it doesn't always start off as something physical Mm -hmm. It starts emotional. It starts with conditioning. It starts with isolating you from your friends instead of, you know, oh, I'm, I'm going to go out. We're going to go out to the bar tonight. Oh, no, nah, let's just stay in. And at first it's like, okay, cool. Yeah, let's, let's, let's just stay in. You know, maybe, you know, I'm, I'm going to save some money and not go out like that. And then it became like 
obsessive. And it was just like, I literally could not go hang out with my friends if I wanted to. Mm. And then um, where I really got isolated was he moved me to Buffalo. Now mm. me, I, I like taking care of people. Yeah. That's what I do. I, I don't like people being hurt. Um, people are sick. I don't like them not being taken care of properly. Mm -hmm. And um, his mother was very sick. Mm -hmm. um, God rest her soul. Um, she had um, heart congestive heart failure. Mm -hmm. She was diabetic. So she was a kidney failure. She was on dialysis. A lot of different things. Wow. So I'm like, okay, you saying you want to go move back to Buffalo to help take care of your mom? Cool. Mm -hmm. Let's go. And then that's where everything pretty much went down. Shit hit the fan from there. Yeah, went downhill from there. I recognized and noticed his mental illness as well as his mom's. You know, putting them both together in the same room was like, okay, now I see where it came from, mm -hmm. and now I see, okay. I got to get out of here because I'm not about to stay around this. Yeah. Um. So I got isolated. I wasn't able to work um, too much. Then I got pregnant. Oh, no. So, yeah. So once I got pregnant, it was pretty much like, all right, now I really feel like I am stuck here. Mm -hmm. Um. Unfortunately, I did lose my son. Um, I lost him on Christmas Day in 2014. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Everything happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. Um. I still, it's still hard for me to have when people are like, oh, I'm so sorry, because my normal thing is, okay, it happens. Yeah. Everything happens for a reason. You know, had I, had he lived, I wouldn't have my daughter. Yeah. And I wouldn't have my business. I wouldn't be where I'm at today. Yeah. Because I know for myself, had my son lived, I probably wouldn't have left him. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so losing him and then um, having my daughter, my daughter literally saved my life. Mm. Because... I was not about to raise her in that kind of environment and that type of atmosphere. Mm -mm. If I wasn't going to say, she wasn't going to say anything. Mm -hmm. So um, once I lost my son, I already started my plan to, to leave. Mm -hmm. um, I got a job. I started saving my money. It was pinching here and there when, what I could, when I could. Yeah. Um, I was also taking care of his two children. He had moved his kids in the house with us. So mm -hmm. I was just, Boom, right off the bat, overnight stepmom. Wow. Had no control over it whatsoever. Um, he did not take care of his kids. I took care of his kids. <laughs> oh my God. Um, yeah. And you know, it wasn't always, it wasn't always physical. It was more verbally, emotionally. He was a serial cheater. Mm -hmm. Um, and at one point, like when I say my daughter is a miracle, my daughter's a miracle because I don't know how she was conceived. Had to be off of some drunken night because. I didn't want to be near him. I don't want him to touch me, mm -hmm. nothing. He would go to work. I would go in the room. He'd come home from work. I would leave the room. I would go sleep on the couch. You can go sleep in the bed. I want no parts of him touching me. None yeah. of that. Yeah. Like, um, and when I found out I was pregnant, literally the day before, I was on my way to have myself committed. <gasps> I sat down, had a conversation with his mom. Yeah. I'm like, Teresa, I don't know what's going on, but I feel like he's driving me crazy. Yeah, yeah. Like, I can't wrap my head around anything. Like I had lost my son and then finding out when I got back to New York after I had lost my son, you know, not only was he cheating, not only did he get pregnant, he got two girls pregnant. <gasps> same time? One of them at the same time. Oh. One of them decided to keep the baby and she had a girl. And of course I was upset about it. Um, and, you know, just finding out so many different things at that, like I was able to grieve so I couldn't process anything. So I'm like, I don't know what to do. So I'd asked her, you know, mm -hmm. what did you do? Because she went and got herself committed. And she's like, I walked into the hospital and told them I need to be evaluated. So I'm like, okay, that, that's what I'm going to do. So she's mm -hmm. like, wait, tomorrow you have an appointment with your, with your OB, wait till after your appointment. Mm -hmm. And then you can make your decision from there. Yeah. Went to the doctor, found out I was pregnant. Oh my God. Wow. So that kind of like, the line, it from like, there. yeah like had those incidents and all of that lined up the way it did right yep so that gave me even more tunnel vision that I need to leave mm -hmm. and um I had started making my plan and literally one night it must have been about probably like three o'clock in the morning I was waiting for him to come home it was the whole okay where are you at what time are you coming home yada yada yeah. yada yeah he was out doing whatever it is he was doing and a piece just came over me Mm. turned my phone off peace came over me and I literally started making my plan I texted my friend hey um I'm out yeah I'm leaving 
well, when are you leaving? I don't know. All I know is that I need to leave. Yeah. And then things just came into, uh, my father was coming to New York, like my father lived in South Carolina. He was coming to New York and I'm like, hey, if I send you, you know, a couple extra hundred dollars, can you get a truck? Can you drive up here to Buffalo? Come get me. Yeah. And he came, came and, came and got me. I packed up like, he was so oblivious into doing everything that he was not supposed to be doing. He didn't realize that I packed up the house around so he, him. So he, you did it when he wasn't home, right? No, he was home. Oh, he was home? I I literally, it took me a few weeks to pack everything up. I, when I say I sat in my living room floor and I literally arranged my daughter's clothes by size, packed up the entire house around him. We had stuff at his mother's house. I went to his mother's house, packed up my stuff at his mother's house. And everything. So did you tell him you were leaving? Um, he found out I was leaving. He found out about a few weeks before I was set to leave. And that was uh one of the last instances where it got physical with us. Yeah, that's what I was worried. Like if he found out, like did he get physical? Yes, he did. We had a conversation um with his mom because I would always make sure that when we did talk about things that was going on with us, I had a witness. Yeah. So we were talking to his mom about it. I literally had her strapped onto me in the carrier and we were talking and I, you know, I laid down a law. Listen, I'm not going to take your child from you. You know where I'm going. I'm going back to New York City because, yeah. you know, that's where I know I can know I can easily get a job. I can make money. I can do what I need to do. Mm -hmm. um, cool. And the conversation, I come back in the house. A few minutes later, he comes in the house, asks to see my phone, tries to fight me for my phone. Um, then literally while I'm still having my daughter hold on to me, he puts his hand around my throat. Oh my God. And I'm yelling, screaming for his mom. His nephew is in the house. Nobody wanted to get involved. Um, I literally, I dug my nails as deep as I can into his arm for him to let go. And the last thing he said was call the cops if you want to. When I come back, I'm going to come back and blow your face off. <gasps> yeah. So went home, locked him out. He had to call the cops to be able to get in the house because I was not allowing him to come in the house mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at all whatsoever. And I'm like, listen, yeah. you know when I'm leaving, you can go stay with your mom and so yeah. I leave. Yeah. Um, so when I did leave, um, well, a lot of people don't understand when it comes to TV and when you're going through like the homeless um, shelter and path of that, they run an investigation. You have 10 days um, to be considered eligible to go into a DV shelter. Mm -hmm. um so the cops went up to buffalo they interviewed his mom and stuff like that because i got a phone call what did you do um who did you who did you talk to why were the cops why did the cops come to my door mm -hmm. yada, yada yada the cops mm -hmm. came and they questioned me they questioned the neighbors mm -hmm. yeah because what he did to me like i'm not gonna sit here and lie yeah yeah like no um, so even after that, getting into the shelter, going through the whole shelter system was a whole nother nightmare of its own. So you were doing um, the shelters in New York now, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I was in the Bronx and I mean, in hindsight, the weekend that I went, granted it was like Labor Day weekend, but it was so, it was long. It was a, I would not wish that experience on anyone to have to go and sit in this building all day long, literally have to retell my story over and over and over and over and over again yeah. to multiple people. Because what some women do is um, they know that the fastest way to get an apartment, the fastest way uh, anything is to say DV because we are priority. They help yeah. DV people first. So yeah. people will lie. Like, um, oh, I'm gonna make up this lie with my boyfriend. Hey, I'm gonna need you to punch me or whatever. Let's get a police report so we can get an apartment. So they, when I say they thoroughly and make sure that they check your stories and stuff like that, yeah. I also had copies of police reports mm -hmm. and things like that. So those are things that help you to prove that, mm -hmm. you know, but there's still, like I said, there are still a lot of people who do it fraudulently. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So going through that system was hell. It was terrible. Mm -hmm. Terrible. I felt um, I even explained, you know, the one good thing about the place that we were in at, you know, we did have like group therapy sessions and things like that. So you learn that, you know, about other people and how mm -hmm. other women got through it and hearing their stories and knowing that, you know, you're not alone and you can mm -hmm. identify like, okay, hey, you know what? Well, he did the same thing to me. Mm -hmm. And this was the same tactics that you do. Abusers are mostly narcissistic people. I can't just yeah. say men yeah. because it, 
of being domestic abusers and people who are abusive and manipulative, it, co it crosses color lines, yes. incomes, yep. cultures, yep. whatever. It's not just a man putting their hands on a woman. It's not just a woman hitting, putting their hands on a man. It's parents, it's yeah. friendships, it's, yep. you know, it's homosexual relationships mm -hmm. and things like mm -hmm. that, you know. Yeah, it's like gaslighting and all of it. Like I'm yep. learning about all those narcissistic and gaslighting and all that description. Mm -hmm. of, yeah. And it's not always, abuse isn't always physical. Yeah, the, it's emotional, the it's most, psychological, it's incessive. Yeah, and those are the most detrimental ones because yeah. even as today, you know, it's been seven years, almost seven years, mm -hmm. um, there are times where I still doubt, question myself. There's yeah. there's self-doubt, you know, are you, are you worthy of what it is that you're doing and things like that because um, people are narcissistic abuse, you know, they make everything about them. So yeah. they're the victim. So you feel like, okay, well, maybe I did deserve that. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a lot of things. So like, I encourage everyone to go to, to therapy, please speak to somebody. Like I even have people call, contact me. If you need someone to talk to, my inbox is always open. I leave my phone number in a lot of these groups. I have people come and talk to me. People come ask me for help. I've helped dozens of women leave their abusers, get to permanent residence somewhere safe, get somewhere safe, help through, you know, Here's what you have to do when you go to court. Here's what you need to do when you go through the shelter system. And I yeah. find resources in different states, like all over the country, I, I have helped people that's, because that's of phenomenal. what I've been through. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's phenomenal. I commend you for that to be able to go through your experience and be outspoken of it and to help other people because a lot of people get into that state of being too like closed off and to feel too vulnerable to share those stories. And for you to be out there. So I appreciate you and thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. I mean, like, it, it's crazy. It was prophesized over me years ago in the same church where my mother uh, went to, um, one of the um, pastors, she prophesied over me and she said, you know, you're going to go through some things that's going to allow you to help other people. Mm. And, you know, in hindsight, that's what it was. I, I, yeah. I did that. Yeah. And I continuously do it every single day. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I, I dealt with, you know, molestation and, and things that, you know, a lot of things are, you know, swept under the rug, you know, you're not supposed to tell family secrets and yeah. no, I believe in telling somebody, I don't, I hate the whole what's done in this house stays in the house. No, what's done in this house does not stay in this house. What's done in this house, it need, if need be, need to speak to someone outside of the house. Yeah, exactly. And like, I grew up in that kind of household where it's like, you never talk about your problems, anything that's happening within the family you don't talk about it so for me to eventually be able to tell my story like it's disgusting it's like what the fuck you know but I want to be able to tell it just so I can help other people and for them to realize like well like for me in high school no one would ever notice or see that I was abused at home because I put on a, a great mask I was you know a B students I was in yearbook I was in tennis I was in volleyball I was like in art club so I was super social and academic and into everything and was friendly with all kinds of different types of people so no one would really know that so for me to then flip it now as I get older and 46 to tell the story and then for people to be like wow all right well I never knew that about Linda and the fact that mm -hmm. you went through all that fucking crazy shit and still was able to be a successful artist mother of two and you know, be a single mom and make it, then somebody else who might hear that story will be able to be like, all right, I can do it too. She got out. I can do it also. Yep. Yeah. Like in high school, I, I was very depressed and I hid my depression in being super active. Mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. a peer mediator. I was in, you know, I was in band. I was doing, I did a lot of extracurricular, extracurricular things like People knew me in high school because of so many things that I did. Yeah. And especially as being a peer mediator, that was something I started in, what was that, junior high? Mm -hmm. Yeah, at first I was a peer leader in um, in elementary school. And then when I got to junior high, I was a peer mediator. So I've always been the type of person to be able to talk to about anything. I was always that, that friend that if you needed someone to talk to, I was there. Like I would literally get pulled out of class. Mm -hmm. Oh, someone needs to speak to you in the Center for Peace or, yeah. you know, you're needed for mediation and sense of peace. I was that go-to person. Wow. And it's like, you know, I wish I had, I wish I had me. Yeah, you needed you. I, I, I needed me. And, you know, I gave me to everyone else. And it's like, man, when I, when I needed 
me, I didn't have that person. Yeah. I didn't have a me in my corner. So I give me to, to everybody who don't have that person in the corner. That, like I said, that was literally always me. I hate myself in all my extra, extra correct um, things. I was in the musicals, you know, I did Annie when I was a junior, mm-hmm. when I was a freshman, I did The Wizard of Oz, um, I played sports, I ran track, mm-hmm. I did cross country, mm-hmm. I was a rhythm marcher, so. Oh my so God, she, you did like a lot of things your mom did. <laughs> yes, literally, when I say we are the same person, we are the same person, we literally wow. did the same things, like yeah. my adoptive father had told me at one point when I was looking for her, and he's like, you know, I can't tell you her name and that because I just don't know. And he's like, but if you show me a picture of her, um, you know, I can tell you who you are. Um, during my adoption, I mean, they, they had like showed them pictures and stuff. And he's like, I remember seeing a picture of her on a stage. So, <gasps> yeah. yeah. So it's like, there's, man, there's so many things that we, we have done. We've had the same teachers. Yeah. Um, craziness. Wow. That is like, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be in our book. Like there's, it's our book is going like I don't know if she told you so we're writing she did, a book. She did. At the we're, end yeah, of so we're writing books together. Um, it's gonna be like a series. I know um, it's exciting. It is. It is. It is so exciting. So we're looking for ghost writers because I'm horrible at writing. I can tell mm-hmm. you a story. Mm-hmm. I can tell it to you. I can write it in my own way. I'm just not into the whole formatting type. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I have so many different things that I do with myself on a daily. So mm-hmm. writing a book is like. I know it's very daunting. That's that's what I mean. Oh my gosh. Like, I was actually I was actually thinking the same thing where I originally was like, oh my God, I want to write my book, but I'm not a writer. I was like, maybe I should get a ghost writer. Then as I was doing some podcasts, you have to check out um, a series that I'm doing with um, Dr. Sunrise um, Scott, um, one of my friends from high school, and um, she wrote her book. So it actually perfectly coincided that I started my podcast, but she wrote her book. So now we're switching and I helped her with her podcast and then she's going to help me um, figure out my book and as I was, so as I was speaking to her I was like oh my god like I really should just make it an art book because that's who I am like I'm an artist and I love collaging and I love poems and I love quotes so technically the book will be a giant coffee table book of everything you know so I don't have to worry about it looking like a regular book it's just going to be an art book I mean in this day and age you know I think, you know, if this is how you want your book to come across, if you're showing exactly who you are, it's yeah. not going to be in this, you know, black and white in this yeah. set format. No, it's going to be how you want to represent, how you want it to, to be shown. Yeah, exactly. So I was like, oh my God, that's it. So I'm going to do it like that. So then like the pressure is a little bit off, you know, but yeah, I totally understand where I'll be like, oh my God, just someone else just ghostwrite it. I'll tell you the stories and you just run with it. <laughs> right. Because yeah. I mean, when I say I have stories, Mm-hmm. Man, I have stories, I have experiences, some traumatic, some yeah. awesome, some funny. Yeah. Like I auditioned for American Idol. I also auditioned for America's Got Talent. Oh my God. Like, for yeah. Some, that's amazing. How did you do in them? Um, I didn't make it, obviously. That's um when I did American Idol, try. so that's, that's I something. did um the producer said I auditioned the right year, but in the wrong city. um I auditioned in Philly because it worked they didn't have it in New York that year so you know it's the China bus to Philly yeah um I made it to the round before the live audition okay so there's five rounds before you even get to the 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 famous people the judges and stuff like that before you are on there so I made it to round four well, hey. And they were like, hey, if you can get to Chicago by the next auditions, you know, we'll pass you through. And I'm like, yeah, no. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm good. Yeah, this yeah. is as far as I go. Yeah. Without a guarantee. And same as when I did um, America's Got Talent, um, I auditioned. And when they called me back, I was already working in Hawaii. So it's like, uh, oh. I can't do the live audition because if you're t- if you're going to promise me like, hey, at least if I can make it to the Vegas, if we could say, okay, at least I make it to Vegas, yeah. cool but I have to read no yeah it wasn't yeah. it wasn't that kind of risk that I was willing to take at that point well hey listen I I give you kudos for you know putting yourself out there and going for it because a lot of people get stuck of like oh I want to do that but don't even put themselves out there to even risk it you know so you went out and you did it so hey kudos to you for that thank you you know in Hawaii I thought it was a scam yeah because <laughs> I had just gotten scammed 
by this whole, um, there's supposed to be this African American network, and they were doing all these type of shows and stuff yeah. like that. And then come to find out it was a scam. Oh, really? So when I found the posting for the job, it was like, oh, work on a cruise ship, yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, mm-hmm. you're mm-hmm. like, this is fake. Yeah. So I dressed up, sat down, came in, and I was like, oh, this is legit. Like, this, this, mm-hmm. is, this is for real, for real. And yeah. I actually got hired on the spot. Oh, they that's gave me my amazing. conditional offer on the spot. And they're like, hey, you're going to get an email in a few days. Um, just follow everything that needs to be done. Um, yeah. In my class, I was like the person who got through the fast because it was like, all right, boom. Okay, you need to do this. You need to do this. You need to go take uh, a blood test. Like we need, you know, most jobs are like, oh, in the past 10 years, have you, have you did yada, yada, yada. Nah, working for them. It was like, have you ever been hospitalized? Have you ever been arrested have you ever been convicted of crime so just trying to do my full background and doing mm-hmm. blood work and then you know we had to be cleared by the coast guard um and certain fingerprinted and so many different things i got there let's say i had the interview in september mm-hmm. um i started working in january oh wow so you like, there were people yeah. who yeah there are people who are waiting for like 18 months to get a job one lady really? was like oh I've been on the wait list for like three years to work out here. And I was like, what? They was like, oh, how long did it take you? Like months. Like three, three months. <laughs> like, months? it didn't take me that long. I got all my stuff together. Oh, so you said um, okay. you were also molested. Like, what happened with that? Like, um, it was one of my adoptive brothers. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, a lot of people, like, my, my cousin went through the same thing. And when she did tell, um my family about it you know everyone was in denial Mm -hmm. and things like that so I didn't really say anything about it but my siblings knew what was going on yeah but it was just like like I said everything just got hushed swept under the rug how old were you how long did it happen for um I want to say probably around the time I was maybe like 10 up until um about high school Mm -hmm. when we finally got it out well it wasn't like it got, it, it got out when I finally would fight back and push back it was it just seemed like it was just you know siblings fighting oh my god and he was in the same household then right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. he was in the same household it was like if I wanted to play the game or anything like that I had to sit on his lap while we played the game mm-hmm. and things like that so. mm-hmm. oh oh my god I'm so sorry yeah See, and that that's that's what happens like when you go through these like situations horrific situations as a child like us like I'm always wanting to help people because I don't want someone to feel bad I don't want someone to be mm-hmm. going through shit or whatever that's why you said like you were a peer media you were helping everybody else because you know how shitty you feel and you're empathetic and compassion so we end up overextending ourselves to like everybody else and then we kind of forget about ourselves Mm-hmm. you know and um, I still I still I still struggle with that you know I'm an empath I'm very you know mm-hmm. um in depth with myself with my feelings you know I am um with spirituality you know with my ancestors yeah. and you know I can tap into different you know I can I sense everything I feel everything I yeah. see everything so even now as an adult you know I'm still learning my boundaries you know yes. not to because mm-hmm. you can't pour from an empty cup yes so I I it's it's so hard, it is really hard. <laughs> how old are so you now? hard how old are you now I'm 35 35 okay yeah like I I tell I know, everybody I look like it. you look beautiful <laughs> well, I'm 46 you don't look it <laughs> at all it's the hair and the glasses and the makeup um but I honestly like my mom so I tell people like I my birth was my like when my mom passed away her death was my rebirth so she passed away in 2013 and sorry to hear that I know it was really tough but when she passed away like it really puts a spotlight of like oh shit like I don't want to die unhappy like am I am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing am I happy in this marriage And it ended up that I eventually got a divorce because I wasn't happy, you know, like I wasn't, I was empty. I was completely empty. I didn't know who I was anymore. I I always say like around that age, I don't even know how old I was at that point, but around the age of 40 is like really where I started to really be awake and open my eyes to everything. And 
look at myself of who I want to be and like start healing all of those wounds from childhood. And mm -hmm. literally the past two years, I've been just unpacking everything because if you're such a young kid from me from age five to high school, I was just in pure fight or flight survival mode. So I never got to feel sad. I never got to feel pain. I never really cried about it. I just swept it under the rug and didn't feel it and just moved on my life of like, I have to get the fuck out of here. And what do I need to do to get the fuck out of here? Mm -hmm. You know, do good in school, go to college and get the hell out. But like, you don't feel any of those because you can go to therapy and talk about one or two problems that you had and you can tell them what you went through and you cry, but you're not really processing it. You're not really unpacking it. And the past two years, all I've been doing is just crying and unpacking because you have to actually feel, and I'm actually like realizing like I'm mourning and grieving that childhood that I never mm -hmm. had. And it's like, you know, hopefully I'll get there by the end of the year and stop crying. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, what, what I, what I tell people, you know, it's, it's so, it's okay to feel it, feel yeah. it, please do you feel your feelings, yeah. yep. sit with it for a little bit, but just don't sit with it for too long, mm -hmm. you know? um analyze it evaluate you know COVID really did like when they say hindsight is 2020 oh for real like yeah. it is you know I think with COVID gave a lot of people that time to really sit and find out who you are yeah you know find out exactly what makes you happy not not what makes you feel good what makes you genuinely yeah happy yeah you know and that's how you know sit with it, sit, sit with your grief. It, it's okay. Grief is so weird mm -hmm. how, how it happens. And, you know, I was so depressed as, as a teenager and even, you know, as a kid, it's like, it really does destroy your memory. Yeah, exactly. Like, so seriously. Exactly. It like, really does. People tell me a lot of things, like even my siblings, you know, they were talking about so many things that we did as kids. And I'm like, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Yes. Like, yes. You don't remember? No, I don't remember yes. any of that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, um, being a kid and, you know, like my parents did foster care. So there was always kids coming in and out of the house. Really? Always. Oh yeah. Always. And I was adopted out of the hospital. Like, so I don't know what it's like to grow up in foster care, but hearing the stories from, you know, my siblings and all the kids that came through the house, because any kid that came through my house as a foster kid, I consider you my sibling. Yeah. You how know? many, how many siblings did you have and how many did they have in the house? Um, a lot <laughs> a lot wow so my my adoptive parents they gave birth to three boys okay and then uh adopted four okay so me and my me and my older sister were adopted and then two of my brothers were adopted but okay. my brothers we don't communicate with the family with them anymore okay um one of them who was the one who actually did molest me yeah. um he ran away after high school. He didn't want to join the Navy, so he ran away. Mm -hmm. um, and the other one, he's in and out of jail, prison all the time. He's like a career criminal. Oh, no. Um, yeah. So at one point, there was, I want to say, 11 of us. Wow. All together at one point. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But there were so many kids coming in and out. Um, there were kids who, you know, were with us for years then they went off and got adopted or they went yeah. back to their parents or something yeah. like, that. like I've heard like so many different like nightmare stories from what what they went through so it's kind of like when I went through what I did with my brother it was like well in my mind it wasn't as bad as what everyone else went through so to me it wasn't that serious wow so you know to to bring up to tell anybody you know because of versus what everyone else had been through yeah, yeah um but yeah so like I like I said I was very depressed as a kid because you know I'm in a house with all these kids yeah. I don't remember exactly when my parents sat me down and told me that I was adopted yeah um it was somewhere between fourth and fifth grade mm -hmm. um because I remember in fifth grade during I think it was dare which is a horrible program by the way um <laughs> there ain't do nothing okay yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah that no i have never been approached by anybody asking if i want to do drugs ever yeah so yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but during the it was either dirt health or dare when they were bringing up um 
how babies are small when they are born from women who smoke cigarettes or like that. So I'm like, hmm, maybe that's why I was so small, yada, yada, yada. Mm-hmm. And then um, my teachers called my mom and was like, uh, she's saying that she's adopted. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and I'm like, nah, for real, I was adopted. Like, I was telling yeah. my art teacher one day, me and my, my classmates we were talking about it. And I'm like, you know, um, I think I was left in the hospital when I was born. My parents didn't want me. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I was adopted. And my art teacher was like, she really got like super upset with me. Like, why are you lying? You are not adopted. And I'm Your like, teacher? Your teacher said that? Yeah. She she called my mom, like, oh, she's in class, told me that she was adopted, saying that she was left in the hospital. And mom was like, Yeah, well, she is adopted. And yeah. you're like, no, for real. Yeah. Yeah. The crazy thing is, I look like my siblings. Me and my brothers look alike. Me and my adopted father, I look like I could be his daughter. Like, wow. Had they not said anything to me, he'd be like, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Super believable. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so, you know, seeing, you know, other kids, you know, they're telling me about their moms. And yeah, even though some of them are coming from horrible situations mm-hmm. and things like that, you know, you still have some kids who go to see their parents on the weekends or, you know, you'll get to be with your mom and stuff like that. And it's like, here I am in this house, you know, everyone else has their parents and it's like, okay, I don't know mine. Yeah. Like, I don't know who it is that I see when I look in the mirror. Yeah. I don't know who my personality traits are. I don't know who I look like. Yeah. I don't know. I didn't know any information. So mm-hmm. that takes a toll on a kid, you yeah. know, yeah. not knowing literally anything about yourself. Where you came from, who your parents are and what they look like and their background and all of it. So, mm-hmm. yeah, you're exactly- and you know, yeah and when I did find when I when I did find her um having that conversation with my adoptive mother that was a hard conversation to have because she was angry like oh well how did you find her how did you know her name you didn't even know any of this and like that it's like well I looked it up myself yeah like I had wrote a letter to Oprah I had wrote an email to Troy the locator um I wrote a letter to Newsday because I knew Mm -hmm. she lived in the same neighborhood yeah. So maybe somebody knew I would ask about, um, I asked the school guidance house, I'd ask for yearbooks from different things I would asked, you know, I'd ask a lot of people who were around her age, you know, um, hey, I don't know if you remember around the time, I don't know if you remember any girl who's pregnant in school, mm-hmm. whether it was in the eighth grade or ninth grade or, yeah. or anything like that. And yeah. One woman did was like, yeah, I do remember a girl being pregnant, but no one knows what happened to the baby oh, afterwards or, or anything like that. Yeah. Um, so it was really hard to growing up, seeing other people go with their parents and things like that. So it gave me a complex. Like I said, I don't remember a lot of my childhood. Yeah. How because was I was your, depressed. How was your parents? Like, were they loving and um, supportive or also like when they found out about, you know, your abuse, like, were they you know, upset and, and like wanting to help you and yes and no. Mm-hmm. Um, my father was emotionally abusive, okay. verbally abusive, you know, mm-hmm. there was no really like having a conversation with him about anything without him being getting upset and mm-hmm. angry. And but yelling. what I realized with him, I don't like to say, oh, it's not exactly entirely his fault, but he was in the military and he fought in Vietnam. Oh, so, okay. so okay. Well, a lot of things that come down with, with my adoptive father, a lot of things, it's like, okay, I get it. I, I understand. As an adult, mm-hmm. I understand. Mm-hmm. As a child, we don't no. understand that. No. You know, oh, we have child, to be quiet that. in no. the house. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And my mother, she actually went to school for psychology, so she was very manipulative, very emotionally abusive. If you didn't see how she wanted things to go, it, yeah. was, it was a problem. Like, mm-hmm. anything that I wanted to do to benefit myself was a problem. When I got my first job, she was angry. Well, how are you going to get to work every day? I can figure it out. I can. Take well, she should be happy. You got a job and want to. Work. Right. I was sixteen. My very first job. Like yeah, I was a telemarketer. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah, it was just like anything I did was was a problem. When I went out for the musical, it was a problem. So who's going to come and pick you up now? Now that you're going to be in the school all night long and yeah, it was it it was always something. Yeah. Um. It was more they wanted to push academia more push education oh you have to go to college you need to do this you need to do this yada 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 there there was no oh I don't want to go to school it was no you had to go to school yeah but even though I paid for and did 
my school, myself, my student loans, everything is in my name. Mm -hmm. Um, When I felt like I didn't want to be anymore, I didn't. I was no longer passionate. Like, I wanted to be a lawyer. Like, I wanted to be a lawyer. Me and my brother had a plan. We were going to mm-hmm. um, have our own law firm. And mm-hmm. neither of us stuck to what we went to school for. <laughs> I am the black sheep of my family. Really? I am the one who I did everything on my own terms. Wow. If it didn't make me happy, I didn't do it. Mm-hmm. Even to this day, like that, that I stand by. I don't, I don't believe in living up to anyone else's expectations. That's because you will never live up to yeah. anyone's expectations. Yeah. So you might as it's well like live up to your own. Right. It's like, you either going to accept it or you're not. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good that I'm I'm glad you're like that because then you're more self-sufficient. You don't have to worry about all of those expectations of other people's rules and crap. You just, whatever you're doing for yourself, you know, you got to make yourself happy. And that's rule number one is self-care. Mm-hmm. Like I'm really close to, um, to my sister, Felicia. Like when I say close blood could not make us any closer. If anyone's like, oh, that's not your sister. I'm like, nah, that's my sister. Mm-hmm. Oh, but you don't know. Nah, I, I I don't care about that. That's that's my sister. And when I say we are really close, like we used to get in trouble with each other as as kids, um, as babies, we would jump in each other's cribs, <laughs> steal each other's bottles. Mm-hmm. Um, we were pretty much forced twins till about maybe like ten, no, nah, not even maybe to like twelve years old. Like yeah. We had the same clothes. Mom would style our hair the same way. We went on vacation. We literally wore like the same. That's funny. the same thing. You couldn't tell until puberty hit that we weren't twins. Yeah. Like yeah. people, like to this day, I can guarantee you, there's so many still out there that believe that me and my sister are twins. <laughs> We're not twins. First of all, she's taller than me. She's lighter than me. Mm-hmm. Like, nah, we're not twins. Well, how, so how it started? Um, I'm not the type of person to just sit and do nothing. I can't do nothing. It's not in me to do nothing. Like I need to be making making money some way somehow. I need to be doing something creative. Something yep. I, I have my mind. I have to keep my mind occupied. So being that I was in the shelter, and you know we weren't really allowed to do much. If I had to leave, my kid had to come with me. We had mm-hmm. to sign in. We had to sign out. We had a curfew. Um, let's say I made friends with someone who was not in my unit we weren't allowed to go to each other's units oh no to to talk with each other no we had to be in the community room downstairs like there was no tv oh there was like there was no cable no nothing so it's like so we're gonna sit down there and do what exactly yeah yeah i guess read a book and that's it (laughs) right so you know um you start to talk and like my my roommate um at the time her name was frances Mm -hmm. um she had she had a daughter named Taylor. She was cool. One, she was barely ever home because she had a job. Yeah. So she would be out first thing in the morning, wouldn't come back until like right after curfew or right when she got off of work. Mm-hmm. So I was pretty much alone. Yeah. It was just me and my infant. Yeah. So um my daughter's first birthday, you know, first birthdays are important. So I was like, I'm gonna make all these different things. So I'm sorry, I made my truffles. Mm-hmm. Um, I did a few different flavors and then they like brownie and something else. And then like afterwards I had so much leftovers because nobody showed up. Um, so we had so much leftovers and then what we would do is once the kids, once our kids were asleep, we would sit out by the fire escape, we'd mm-hmm. open the window and we'd smoke. Yeah. So we're smoking and we, and she's like, yo, I would pay you to make these for me. Mm. And I'm like, how much would you pay? Yeah. And she was like, I don't know yet, but I tell you, I, I would I would pay you to make these in there birth my business. Yeah, yeah. So when we would have like our um our group sessions, our therapy sessions, whatever, you know, they would bring snacks. So I'm like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna bring these yeah. and have them try them out and let me know how how they feel. So yeah. I started selling them in the shelter. In the shelter, in therapy and whatever, right? Yep. I was sell to like um one of the ladies who ran the daycare. She ordered from me. Um, a few of the workers would order from me. And then when Valentine's Day came, everyone was like, Oh, I want to get these for my mm-hmm. friend. I wanted this for my boyfriend, for whoever. Mm-hmm. So I started boxing them. And then I really started selling stuff. And then that's that's, that's amazing. See, like yes. if you got an idea, just fucking just take some action, right? Yeah. And like, I like literally, I pitched like for my daughter's first birthday, like, so we would get, um, 
$30 a week to go to the grocery store, you know, to get little cards, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I sacrificed, okay, I'm not going to get too much stuff for me to eat this week. I will just stick to my ramen mm -hmm. so I can get the stuff I need. And to sell make it. it. Yep. And sell it. Mm -hmm. That's, yep. that's hustle. That's art and hustle. See? Art. Yeah. And then like, <laughs> I literally just started with truffles and it wasn't until, um, till COVID hit until lockdown since I branched out and started making other things. So, you know, 420 and I'm like, oh yes, it's 420 mm -hmm. in the year 2020. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, okay, I need something else. So one of my friends at the time, um, her mom had cancer and she's like, well, you know, I know how cannabis works and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You can make my mom some brownies. You yeah. know, she likes the truffles, but you know, she wonders if you can make like a full, give her like a pan of brownies. Yeah. So I'm like, all right, cool. She's like, how much charge? I'm like, I'll charge you 60 bucks for a full pan of brownies. Yeah. So once I started doing that and then mm -hmm. I, she had posted about it and then people were like, oh, you make brownies now? And I was like, yeah, yeah sure. I make brownies now. Mm -hmm. And then it went from there. And then I started making brownies and then mm -hmm. my first uh, pop-up shop after covid i'm like okay now i can't just go with truffles and brownies mm -hmm. i need something else what else can i do and i'm like you know what let's make some cookies yeah so i made cookies and then i've ordered the wrong size pan from amazon mm -hmm. and it was like really small and i'm like this is not how big it wanted to be then boom they're both a different size of my brownies mm -hmm. so i have brownies in three different sizes and then I just started making different things. And even with my truffles, like I like uh, one of my friends, she's really good at coming up with different flavors. Mm -hmm. Like I've done Krispy Kreme, um, tiramisu, peanut butter and jelly. Mm -hmm. I did a Chambord cheesecake. Oh, that sounds um, fun. I did, oh, <laughs> it was so, so good. I did um, Malibu cheesecake. Mm -hmm. um, what else have, have I done? Like, you name it, I could do it. And that's what I tell people all the time. Like, if you come up with a flavor, give me like five or 10 minutes, I'll let you know if I can make it or not. Yeah. Nine times out of 10, I could do it. There's barely any time I say, nah, I can't do it. Unless it has peanut butter in it because I'm allergic. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. other than that, I could do it. That's amazing. So are you doing that now full-time or do you have another another hustle, a full-time hustle? Um, no, I do that full time, but I have so much more than just my baked goods. I have teas. Like I said, I'm an herbalist, so I yeah. have like herbal remedies, a little bit, a little bit to help everyone. I have stuff for, for ladies. I have stuff for your cycle. I have stuff for, you know, PMS. Yeah. Um, I have stuff that helps when I say literally melt your cramps. And when I say yeah. you don't know you're in your period until you go to the bathroom, if you yeah, smoke yeah, it yeah. or you can drink it like a tea, you don't know until you go to the bathroom. It actually helps you shorten your cycle, make your cycle. Wow. Lighter. I love that. That's like a lot of like Chinese herbs. I love yes. like herbs. Coffee so, and coffee. So like I need something. Mullen. To like, mullen. Okay. I need something to mullen. clear this out because it's like irritating yep. me. Like in all of my, so my blends, you can smoke them, you can see them, drink them like a tea, mm -hmm. or you can just take and sprinkle in your bath water and just, and soak in them. Oh yeah, that's a good um, idea too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really good. Like, you know, I, I look out for, for everybody. Like I said, yeah. listen, if you don't want to smoke, cool, you could drink it. Yeah. You don't want to drink yeah, it like, as I a love, tea. I always like taking bath like teas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Like my teas now, I just started a new tea, tea line products. Um, I have about 30 different teas. Ooh. Yeah, I, I like tea. I like drinking I love tea. I like tea. drinking my medicine. Yeah, so. I love tea. I love natural things. Um, I'm all about that, like, you know, natural stuff too, you know, so that's amazing. So I'd love to push that. What else, what else, let's, let's, what else can we promote of yours? Let's see. I have lemonades um, that I make. Um, what else do I have? What about I have the my party days and my club days because I was also a party promoter. Yeah. Um, oh, I was less pregame. Now, yeah. now it's just smoking or CBD. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now it's like let's smoke. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, you like know, if I'm gonna drink, it's healthy. It's like, like I'll, I'll drink some wine. I'll have a cocktail here and there, but drinking like I used to. No, no, can't do it. What got me into drinking less was working in Hawaii. Because it's like working on a cruise ship. So it's like, you know, we had our own little crew on, but they didn't yeah. sell like alcohol out there. It was either beer or wine. So it's mm -hmm. like, hmm, do I want to get off the boat? Yeah. Get dressed up, go out to the bar or a club, or whatever, spend $8 or $8 to $10 on a drink. Or do I just want to put my pajamas on and go to a crew bar and get a glass of wine for $1.50? 
Yeah, a dollar fifty. Mm. I think that's better. Right. right. I'm gonna stay on board, and if I get super wasted, I can just go walk to, to my room. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of trying to convince security that I'm not drunk. Yeah. So they don't breathalyze me so I don't get fired. Mm. I'll just stay on board. Yeah. Like, yeah, when you work on a cruise ship, like, if you blow, let's say you come on board and you're visual, you could tell, they could tell that you're drunk. Mm -hmm. They breathalyze you. Mm -hmm. If you blow over a point oh four, you already know, go, you might as well go to your room and start backing because you're going to get fired in the morning. Oh, wow. Yeah. So. Point, point oh four sounds really pretty pretty low right that is like two drinks an hour oh okay yeah it's that like yeah. one and a half drink an hour because mm -hmm. when you're working on board so not only is it just you know what position you hold yeah. um you still have to help depending on your scores whatever you have to help with evacuating passengers yeah. if you know if shit goes down you know you had your assignments that you had to do yeah um one of my assignments was crowd control so there were days where, you know, you couldn't get off the boat. You yeah. were a red flag. So you can't get off because that means if something is to happen, if I'm drunk, mm -hmm. I can't help nobody else. No. Because I'm drunk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can't so, do mm -hmm. Yep. So, you know, I learned not to, not to drink. So my tolerance went super down. Like, yeah. I'm such a lush right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Two drinks will probably get me a little, will probably get me tipsy yeah so, yeah 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 but no i i like to smoke it's just okay. something about smoking that just it's it's relaxing you know it's me even if i'm by myself or if i'm with my friends it's just something different when it yeah. comes to to smoking yeah so next time like i used to have like art parties where i would have vendors and all the and then i have art on the wall vendors you know around the room <laughs> And then I'll have like body painting and live art. So if I next, if I ever throw another one, I'll definitely contact you and you can be one. Oh, of I'm down. I I, you know? I love, I love doing stuff like that. Like I do, um, I did a puff and paint mm -hmm. once. Um, I did a sip and paint. I really want to do a tea party. Hmm. That's cute. Um, any other crazy so stories to tell me? One time for, this is the only time I, that I'm offering this. I'm doing gummies. Only for only for, for the for the Christmas season. I hate gummies. Yeah. Um, I love gummies. <laughs> it's just like I don't know. I I'm a baker and I like chocolate. Yeah. And when it comes down, see when I break down with people the difference um, when it comes between like different things when it comes to smoking and edibles and like that. Um, baked goods is completely different than it is with gummies oh. because with gummies, so not only are you gonna crash from the high you're gonna get, you're also gonna crash from the sugar. Oh, so that's why I don't really oh. like doing gummies because yeah. I mean, I do stuff that I don't eat. Like I don't eat most of the stuff that I make, yeah. which is crazy. People are like, you don't need it. No, I literally have a freezer stash of cookies and brown stuff because I don't, I don't eat them. Because well, it's sugar too. Like you're going to crash from the sugar, no? From the cookies too? <laughs> yeah, that too. But it's not as heavy as it is with, so, yeah, yeah, with so and it's like the process of doing, doing gummies even though when my chocolate work is very tedious like that dealing with gummies it's just a lot it's, and I it's, just, too, it's too much it's too much like I gotta yeah. put stuff in the mold and then they gotta sit right then I gotta pop them individually out, yeah. out. I don't like that <laughs> yeah you're like listen just but I'm only it. offering it this <laughs> one time same as I'm doing rice crispy treats and like the Captain Crunch cereal bars, and that's I'm only offering it for this holiday season. Yeah. yeah. After that, I'm, I'm I'm not doing it. Yeah, that's good. Just do it just for the short period of time. Here's the yeah, short. There's like, people one. have been asking me for years since I started. Hey, yeah. do you make gummies? No, I don't make gummies. Well, why don't you make gummies? Because it's annoying. Because it's annoying. It yeah. is. It's 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 not what I'm passionate about. I like baking. I like yeah. chocolate. Yeah. Like that's what I like to do. Like mm -hmm. I fell in love with chocolate when I was what 16, my brother's wedding. Mm -hmm. Like um, we went to some chocolate store in East Islip and I just fell in love with it. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, you tell me I can make this with chocolate and just get yeah. different types of molds and yeah. making chocolate lollipops and stuff. So yeah, I, I like doing that stuff. That's great. So do you have your products like all just selling through the website? Are you selling there anywhere else? Or um, online pretty much. So um, I don't have ordering capabilities yet on my site mm -hmm. um, because, you know, with legalization, it's still 
it's still federally illegal, so I can't necessarily oh, okay. advertise on a website for you to pay and order through this. So pretty much everything is word of done. mouth, mm-hmm. yeah, word of mouth, or through me, through my social medias and stuff like that. I do ship nationwide. Like I have customers in about forty states now. <gasps> That's so, so cool. yeah, yeah, I've had people order from me from Hawaii. I have customers in Seattle, yeah. Vegas, yeah. Minnesota, yeah. Wisconsin, like mm-hmm. all over. So mm-hmm. word of mouth is great. I do okay. pop-up shops here and there. Yeah. So you can always find me somewhere. Okay, awesome. And then you emailed it to me so then I can add it to this podcast and promote it, right? Yeah, I'm on Instagram. I'm on TikTok. I'm on mm-hmm. Facebook. Mm-hmm. Yep. Awesome. I love it. I love it. So I appreciate you coming on here and uh, sharing your story. Uh, any other crazy stories you want to share with me <laughs> before we wrap it up? A crazy story? I don't know. Crazy stories. Hmm. I can tell you about how stupid people are. Yeah. Um. So working in Hawaii, like the water is so beautiful, beautiful yeah. crystal clear. So coming off the tender boats, one day so one of the islands that we go to the big island um we go to the younger side which is the Kona side so we just you know drop anchor and we take the tender boats the life boats back and forth mm-hmm. so I'm getting off the tender boat and the lady's like oh my gosh um she hands me her water bottle she's like can you get me some water and I'm like you want water like from the ocean mm-hmm. and she was like yeah so I take it I put it in the water and back to her and she's like it's not blue I'm like, what color did you expect it to be? It's water. That's funny. And I just hand her, I just close it and hand to her and just went back on. And yeah. security was like, what was that about? I'm like, she thought the water was gonna be blue. Oh my God, that is funny. That's a good one. That's a good story. Yeah, I mean, and and on I have so many stories from working on a boat. Like yeah. they like to say we get from the newlywed to the nearly dead because oh nah, you do. You get, you especially get people with, you know, the luau shirts, yeah. the called aloha shirts, the aloha shirts and the fanny packs and, you know, yeah. socks and sandals. Mm-hmm. And you get people who want to like fight to get a seat by the window. Mm-hmm. It's like, you're on a boat, go outside. <laughs> yes. But yeah, I mean, and I was telling people, listen, you don't work here. Please do not be on this boat every day. I should not have to see you every single day for every single meal service. Get off. Yeah. yeah. Go for a walk. Yeah. Go like, outside. The Go years. Outside. Yeah. Right. Like I worked there. I did what? Three contracts there. We had two sea days. Mm-hmm. And that was only because of uh, back in 2011, the earthquake that hit Japan. Mm-hmm. We were on a tsunami watch and it tore up one of the piers. Wow. But other than that, you're on an island every single day. Get off the boat. Yeah. Yeah, well, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And it's been a pleasure to talk to you. And I feel like we can definitely come on here again so you can tell me some more stories. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. I have, man, I have so many stories. Yeah. I I worked in real, I worked in retail and uh, restaurants for like 15 years. So Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've seen, heard everything. And I appreciate you and have a great day. And I hope your daughter feels better. Thank you. Bye.